Good evening. Hey, it worked better. You know why? Because I don't have control of the mic. <laughs> They've got it back there. Uh, you know, when you get old, you're allowed to forget some things. So I, I do every now and then. I did when I was young, too, so I don't, I don't know what difference it makes. But anyway, anyway, it's good to be with you. It is so, so good. Um, I've had a marvelous experience in my lifetime getting to go so many places uh, to deliver messages from the Word of God. And here's the one thing, the one takeaway that I want everybody to know and to think about. If I can find God's people, wherever I am, I'm always home. And it's been that way everywhere I've ever been. I've been amazed, you know, I've got... Tonight, I've got two different people sitting here, two different families represented, where I've spent time in their homes because I was there to speak. And it was a blessing. It's a friendship. Uh, you know, friendship I have with Doug uh, dates a number of years ago. I, I don't remember when. I'm not sure he does either. It's okay. <laughs> uh, but we had, a, we had a great time. We communicate occasionally by phone, even yet. I will tell you, or I tell everybody, if I can ever help, you know, I, I, I'll do the best I can. If I've got something that will help you, I'll give it to you. I, I, I don't know how much material I loaded on Doug's computer, but it was a pile uh, at that time. So, you know, great, great blessing uh, to do that. And then uh, you get to meet... Uh, Oklahoma boys that come to East Tennessee to learn something. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I pray for Lee Parrish every time that I'm praying for guys uh, that preach the gospel around the world. He's not alone. I pray, I pray for every one of my students by name for all six years of the time I was at school. Now, I pray for them in, generally speaking, in order. You have to be overseas not to be prayed for with your class. And Lee's not overseas. Uh, some people might call Oklahoma that, but it's not. You know, it's, 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 it's a great place. And uh, it, it was, it's good to see him. I'll quit being old man reminiscent, but, uh, but I want you to think about that. Uh, you may wonder about these lessons. I, I've not really said anything, but I do want to say something about everything I've done today. When I moved to Mobile, Alabama, I was a very young man, about 27 years old. Uh, Brother V.P. Black had been preaching the gospel uh, why longer years than I was alive, even at that time. And he had become quite the student of uh, stewardship. You see, our brotherhood was notoriously poor in giving in, way back then. Uh, it just was. And nobody exactly knew the reason. So Brother Black began to study these things. And he ended up writing, oh me, I don't know, six or seven books uh, on the concept of stewardship. You know, Rust is my witness, and there are a bunch more, my God, my money. I don't know how many. He wrote a bunch. And uh, every year in Mobile, what would happen is the elders would come to me, and they would say, uh, Gary, we, uh, we want Brother Black to come teach one of his books on Wednesday night. But he's told us that, you know, he's got meetings. He'll be out of town about six of those, maybe seven of the 13 weeks. So Brother Black says he'll come if you'll be his co-teacher. Is the best blessing I could ever have. Because I got to sit there and watch that man who was a master of this subject. And a man who loved the brotherhood as well as anybody I ever met. And I got to watch him do these types of lessons. When I moved... Uh, from Mobile to Valdosta, Georgia, uh, I told the elders, I said, your, your giving here is abysmal. I said, but I can't preach on it right now because I've just moved here. And what will happen is people think that my salary is tied in with me preaching on giving. I'm, not, I'm just not going to do that. Uh, but I'll tell you who you need to get. And I think because of my friendship, I can get him here. Brother Black came and spoke. And I'm telling you the honest truth. Here's what happened. And their giving was abysmal. I, 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 and they may see this online. If they do, well, that's fine. Because it was at the time. When Brother Black left, our contribution went up $1,250 a week. And it never went down again. Why? 
It's because of what I said this morning. I'll say it one more time at least. God's people have the biggest hearts of any people in all the world. I don't have any doubt about that. I challenge anybody that tries to tell me different than that. Because I've never seen God's people fail to rise to the occasion. They always do it. No matter what. Over and over and over again. So this is not a heart problem. If there is any problem, it's, it's an education problem. And guess whose fault that is? Oh, I mean, just because I've been preaching, you know, about what, uh, ever since, uh, well, ever since I stepped off the ark. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you know how could I possibly have anything to, well, of course, you know, we preachers have failed. You know, we failed to do enough preaching on it. And if you preach in the right way, people don't mind it. I'm not. I'm not browbeating anybody. I'm just saying we all need to learn, don't we? The more we study, the better we get to be at anything. The more we practice, the better we get to be. That's all I'm saying. That's all Brother Black ever said. And it really makes a difference in your life. Now, I'm going to tell you a little secret that goes with it. And honestly, I never would have thought of it. We had an elder in Valdosta after Brother Black came that every few weeks would come by and ask the secretary to make copies those tapes. You know what he used those for? People with marital problems. And I saw him give those tapes on stewardship to couple after couple after couple. He was really the best counselor we had, this elder. And their lives were transformed by a proper understanding of things. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? It worked. Uh, he may still have tapes, I don't know, of <laughs> Brother Black, you know, doing these lessons. So anyway, interesting to me. Uh, but why talk about giving? You know, what's, what's, uh, what is it to us? You know, I mean, wouldn't you think there's, there's bound to be way more references in the, in the Bible to baptism than there are to giving, right? No, uh, not by any means. In fact, giving is mentioned about 1,500 times in the Bible. 1,500. It is a critical issue with God. And the reason it's critical is what, in part, we talked about this morning, because it really sets our priorities. How I view my money, which is not really mine. We're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. But how I view the money that God lets me have in many ways sets the stage for everything I'm going to do. That's just the reality of it. So what's God's attitude toward giving? We know he wrote a lot about it through inspired men. So what is his attitude? Well, I'll tell you, God owns everything. That's where you start. It's all his, every bit of it. Listen, in the book of Job, you, you know, Job is one of those guys I, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with him. He's a great man of, of patience. There's no doubt about that. He starts off so well, but, you know, after those guys just, uh, those three friends, if you, can you call them that? You know, I really have struggles with that. But after the three friends have just bombarded him, bombarded him, he, he starts to express his frustration. And in some ways, he has, he's challenged God uh, in his words on, on areas he should not have gone into. And so you get, you know, deep into the book, you get down about, uh, you know, chapter 38, and God says, okay, let's have a meeting. And boy, do they ever have a meeting. Uh, God asks a series of questions. And by the way, science to this day has not answered all those questions. Till right now, they don't know all the answers. He's letting Job know who's God and who's not. And it's very clear as he goes through that. So you get to chapter 41, verse 11. Listen to one of these questions. Who has preceded me? that I should pay him. Everything under heaven is mine. That's powerful, isn't it? Nobody comes before God. God made it all. God formed the world from nothing. It's interesting that the word that is used in Genesis chapter 1 is a word that literally means to create from nothing. You and I can only manufacture. I mean, we might not use that word, but we take something that exists and turn it into something else, you know, sewing it together or 
or hammering with nails, whatever it is. Well, we have to start with something that exists in order to do. God didn't do that. God made it all from nothing. It's his. There's no denying it. In Psalm chapter 24, verse 1, listen to a song that the Israelites sang. The earth is the Lord and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Go on, another Psalm, 50, and look and see what it has to say. Here again, they're talking about God and singing about his greatness. And he, here's the way he's depicted there. For every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all its fullness. Everything is mine. That's what God said. And we really need to see that and understand it if we really want to appreciate God's attitude toward money. It's all his. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 23, there's an instruction that uh, maybe we need to take note of today in the United States. You know, maybe, maybe we ought to think about it. Listen to this. I know this is for the children of Israel, but just listen to what God said through Moses. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. You are strangers and sojourners with me. Can I put that in our modern day language? You can't put forever on a deed. It's not forever yours. It's not forever mine. It belongs to God. Now, you know, every year they come out with what? The top 100 richest people in all the world. Every, every year. And, you know, Bill Gates is, you know, he's among, you know, the top. If, if he's not on top, he's close. Every year. Let me tell you something about Bill Gates. That money's not going to be his when he dies. I'm going to go a step further. When he dies, they're going to fight over it. You say, well, you may give it all away. I have seen, and you have too, some of you that are older in life, I have seen charities fight over the money that somebody left to them. I've seen lawsuits over that. In fact, truth be known, I was at the school. We were supposed to get some money, and somebody else you know, stepped in and manipulated it. We didn't get it. We didn't sue anybody because they were our brethren. But it wasn't right to be honest. People, when you, you get money out there, they do crazy stuff. I mean, really crazy things. And it's all because they don't recognize who it belongs to in the first place. It doesn't belong to me. It all belongs to God. So what happens with us with that kind of thinking? When you, when you think about, well, God is the owner, and yet we act like it all belongs to us. I want to give you a little parable of sorts that Brother Black used years ago. Uh, the, the money figures be all messed up because everything's changed since then. But I'm going to use it anyway, basically how he did it. I want you to imagine for a moment that that a man is getting ready to go on a, a far journey. He's going to go maybe around the world. And as he sets out, he has money to start with, but he knows he's probably going to need more as he goes along. And so he, he goes to a friend of his and he says, I've got $5,000. Whenever I call you, will you send me whatever I ask you for? Oh, sure, no problem. So the man goes off on his journey. And after a period of time, he calls and says, send me $100. And the guy hangs up, sends the money. Another few days or weeks pass, and he calls and says, Hey, send me another hundred. And the guy sends the hundred dollars. And another few weeks pass, and he calls and says, Hey, could you send me two hundred? And the guy sends him two hundred. And then a few more weeks pass, and he calls and said, Look, I need five hundred dollars. And when he hangs up the phone, he looks at his wife, and he says, Give, give, give. That's all that guy can talk about. What happened? It became his money. It was given to him, but it became his. What do we do? I've wondered at times if I would be in any way encouraged to have a better attitude about money. 
if I had some annual thing I did, if you want to call it a ritual, well, fine, whatever. But if I had something that I did that made me remember, this isn't mine. It all belongs to God. I think that's a really important lesson. One more time, look at the singer of Israel. This time, Psalm 116, verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? And that's really the question, isn't it? Think about all we have, and God gave it to us. He owns it all. He gave it to us. What are we going to give him back for all that he's done for us? So what's God's attitude toward giving? Well, number one, he owns everything. Number two, God gives us money to use in several different ways. Now, some of these, when I first heard Brother Black talk about them, they surprised me. And the more I looked at Scripture, I thought, well, he got it right. He knew exactly what he was talking about. So let's, let's look at that together just for a minute. Uh, first of all, God gives me money by enabling me to work. Now, think about that. If you look at the book of uh, Genesis, we back, went there a while ago. Look at chapter 3, verse 19. In the beginning of that verse, it says, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. In the sweat of your face you're going to eat bread. Well, okay, fine. In the book of Exodus, here we are seeing the law set forth, the Ten Commandments. And as God does that, particularly in Exodus chapter 20, verse 9, he says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. So God gave us an assignment. By the way, brethren, God never meant for man to sit down totally. We, we got this idea of retirement, and we unfortunately we brought it over into the church. It doesn't belong there. The Christian's retirement is heaven. That's it. Christians don't retire. Now, granted... I may not can do today what I did 25 years ago. That's true. But I've still got a work to do. Some of the greatest helpers I've ever found in the Lord's church were elderly widow women. But they were my greatest supporters. One woman I remember in Mobile, Alabama, we barely arrived there. Zoe Taylor said, come over and see me. I visited her house very near to the church building, probably not more than a half mile tops. And I went in, and she said, Gary, that door right there is always open. There's always going to be fruit on a table or something, and there are going to be drinks in the refrigerator. You need to get away from things. You come to my house. Now, if you don't think for a young preacher that wasn't an important something for someone to say, then you've missed it. Young preachers need time to get released from stress, you know, every now and then. And that was a great blessing to have her. I have so many mothers in the faith, I could not even begin to name them. They watch out for me like hawks. And it's a blessing. It is a rich, rich blessing. So I want, I want us to realize as we, as we look at all of this, that that's a part of what what we're talking about. I am richly blessed. God gives it to me by working. And blessings come besides money, don't they? As in those widows that I've just been talking about. Then look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, where the Apostle Paul says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. So here we've got work. We've got a work to do. We're going to work all the way to the end of our lives. We're going to work for God. Don't have to stay at your job all the way to the end of your life. That's up to you. But you do have to continue to work for the Lord. We all do. That's just part of it. He intends for us to labor with our hands and work. Now, watch the Apostle Paul, because to me, he pulls it all together. He goes to Mars Hill. This is Acts chapter 17. As he arrives at Mars Hill, who's there? Well, it's a bunch of Epicureans and Stoics. And it really doesn't matter if you know who they are. Let me just tell you the kind of fellows they are. They like to sit around and chew the fat on new ideas. That's their whole life. It's what they're all about. And they, don't, they couldn't enjoy anything more 
than to have somebody come along and present some new idea. So here comes Paul, and guess what? He's got a new idea. Now, briefly, let me tell you about Athens in Paul's day. Do you know how many idols were in Athens in Paul's day? The historians tell us there were 30,000 idols in Athens in Paul's day. 30,000. How many people were there? 10,000. Now, a Roman satirist, you know what we call him today? A stand-up comedian. That's what we call him. But a Roman satirist literally was uh, said, it's easier to find a god in Athens than it is to find a man. Now, what do you suppose the city council would do in a town with 30,000 idols and only 10,000 people? You could barely move for all the idols. What do you think the city council will do? Well, I'll tell you what they'll do if I can quit wrapping this mic around myself. Okay, <clears throat> I'll tell you what they do. They made a law. You know what the law was? No new gods. Did Paul obey the law? Absolutely. He wandered around looking at all those images. And he finally came upon one that said, what? To the unknown God. And then the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill stood up to tell them about the God that they worshipped in ignorance. And he was going to tell them what he was like. So listen to him. Acts 17, 24 and 25. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things. Now, you all have by now figured out what my job is. How well do you think I could do at that job if I couldn't breathe? It's pretty easy to answer, but now I've got a question for you. I don't know what all your jobs are, but how well do you think you could do your job without breathing? Well, not very well. <laughs> I don't care what it is. I think breathing's somewhat important, don't you? I think it's vitally important. You ask all those people who have had to be on, put on ventilators, you know what they think about it. Breathing's vital. Uh, we've got a young man back home that just came off six straight weeks of a vent. Uh, he'll tell you about breathing. How important is it? It's vital. It's top of the line for all of us. How am I able to work? God gives me breath. Furthermore, he gives me life. Couldn't even, couldn't even be here if it wasn't for him giving me life. And that's exa exactly what Paul says. By the time he gets to verse 28 of Acts 17... He says, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. God made me. He gave me the ability to work, and giving me the ability to work gave me the ability to make money. And yet how many of us will get the paycheck say, my money? Well, I'm afraid too many times. We all do it. We're all guilty of doing that. No, it's not my money. God gave me the ability to work. It's God's money. He also gave me the ability to make money by, listen to this, saving. A remarkable idea. <clears throat> saving in an era when, you know, people not only don't save, they spend on credit cards so that the next 40 years are already committed. You know, so saving, that's a foreign concept. But listen. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20, There is desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it. I told you this morning that I was blessed to learn a little bit about uh, teaching people on budgeting. And <clears throat> one of the things that you, that you have to teach them, this fellow was a kind of a humorist of sorts. I don't know what you know about the restoration plea. But one of the key ideas is we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible is silent. This guy teaching me how to do budgeting said we speak where the budget speaks and we're silent where the budget's silent. <laughs> well, it works. I mean, think about this. This young couple, let's just imagine, struggling with how they're going to pay their debts. We're, we've taught them this technique. 
they're supposed to save every week so they'll be ready to pay well, the car insurance, just as an example. And believe me, that can be expensive. So they're supposed to save a little bit every week. They're putting aside, you know, whatever number it is, say $10 a week, whatever it is, they've got to put it away, right? Every week. Because one day that bill is going to come due. So then they go to their local, uh, you know, establishment that sells things for children. And lo and behold, you know, little Susie and little Johnny have desperately wanted a swing set. And there it is. And the wife says, I wish we could buy that for Susie and Johnny. And the husband says, let me look in the checking account. Hey, we've got enough to pay for it. So they pay for it. Now, how are they going to pay for the car insurance? Do you see what he's talking about when he talks about there's not anything in the house of the fool? He squanders it. Well, he does. He just spends it all. My mother used to call it, that money's burning a hole in your pocket, isn't it, son? I don't know if your mama said that, but it's pretty true, isn't it? <laughs> when you're young, you want to spend it. You get it, spend it. That's the way it is. But that's foolish. What we really ought to do is save it up because I can almost guarantee you a rainy day's coming when you're going to need it. I can almost promise you. God gives us money through, of all things, saving. He also gives us money by investing. Now, look at Matthew chapter 25. And this is one of those parables that everybody in here knows. You probably could tell it to me as well or better than I can tell it to you. And he describes how that a certain master gives talents, that's money, by the way. He gives talents to three of his servants. He gives to one five talents. That man must have been pretty adept at handling things. He gives to another two talents and to another one talent. Everybody's got, according to their several ability, to handle the money. Well, he goes off on a journey and comes back, and he calls them in for an accounting, as it were. What would you do with my money? How's it gone since I've been gone? Listen to the way... It, it transpires. Matthew chapter 25, verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, if you read the two-talent man message you know it's identical i mean he didn't get five more talents he got two more but he gets the same praise from the lord identical no variation whatsoever god's not concerned with how much you have or how much i have he's concerned with how you and i use what we have that's the matter all right you go on down and finally the one talent fellow comes along and in verse 24, it says, Then he had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I've not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I will receive back my own with interest. God gives us money by investing. When we put the money in the bank, it can grow. Now, granted, it's going to not growing right now as fast as inflation is, but it does grow a little bit. And so God gives us money by investing. He also gives us money by, now listen to this, giving. Yeah, look at Luke chapter 6. There's a verse there that I just uh, dearly love. Uh, it's so powerful. Listen to what the Lord says, Luke 6, verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, think about this. Give and it will be given to you. Now, what's good measure? Well, that, that's pretty easy when you think about it. Good measure is what's right. So if you're supposed to get a dollar, you get a dollar. 
That's good measure. But wait a minute, he didn't stop there, did he? Didn't he go on to say, press down? You know, when I turned about 10, my mother said, Son, if you're going to eat like this, you're going to learn to cook. And so I said, Okay. What can I learn to cook? She said, what do you want? I said, well, you know those chocolate chip bars that you make? I love those things. And she said, okay, get all the ingredients out. Here's the, here's the, uh, the recipe. Just get the ingredients out and start. Well, somewhere in there, if I recall correctly, and ladies, just forgive me for my chocolate chip bars. I haven't made them in years. Uh, but uh, it said one cup of brown sugar. So I started spooned in the cup of brown sugar, and I got ready to dump it into the bowl. And she said, oh, wait, 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 wait. I said, what do you mean, wait? It says one cup. She says, that's not a cup. Take your spoon, the back side of it, and press that dark brown sugar down. I said, okay. Now fill it back up till you get to a cup level. Well, I did. And I went, no, 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 no. <laughs> Take that spoon again and press it down. And you keep doing that until you get it all the way up to the cup line. That's pressed down. And man, do those ever taste good. Okay, <laughs> pressed down. That's what, he, that's what he says. All right, then he says, shaken together. Now, everybody in here that's ever gone to the store and bought potato chips or cereal knows what I'm going to talk about. I buy the family size cereal a few years ago, the box is so big it almost takes a crane to get it out of there. And you get home and you open it up. Oh, there it is. And then you read on the box. And what does it say? Contents may settle due to shaking. Well, I'll say. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. <clears throat> they do settle <laughs> for sure. <clears throat> do you know that uh, the moving companies have done some calculations and all this stuff? They say four moves is equal to a house fire. You know why? Because that, that furniture riding down the road in that truck is shaking like this and shakes it literally apart, totally apart. You'd be amazed. You better have some good wood glue when you get wherever you're going. Because you're probably going to have to put some things back together. It's not unusual. Preachers do it all the time. If you need any help, give me a call. I'll explain it to you. So good measure. Press down. Shake it together. And then look at the last one. Overflowing. Overflowing. You know, for me, when I was on the road for the school and I had to get home, the guys were expecting me to be there for an 8 o'clock class the next morning. I was six hours away, and I left wherever I was at 9 o'clock Eastern time. <clears throat> so you know what I did? The best thing ever happened in my life. Pilot didn't come out. They came out with something in addition to the 32-ounce. It was a 44-ounce drink. I don't use ice. I filled the whole thing with Dr. Pepper. <laughs> How did I get home? That caffeine kept me going, let me tell you, all the way to the house. Overflowing, just tell me that I'm going to have, what do they do? Isn't there a, I don't name names, I'm not going to be an advertiser for anybody, but I think there's a restaurant chain that you can buy, you can buy an endless bowl of, and then you name whatever it is. And that means they'll just keep filling it up. It's going to overflow, Right? Because you're going to get more than what it took to fill it up the first time. You're just going to keep on getting. God gives us back in that exact way. Give, and it will be given to you. That's the message. Good measure. Press down. Shaken together. Overflowing. Good measure is what's fair. Everything else is far and above what's fair. Isn't it? And you notice. We set the standard for how God gives. Did you see the end of the verse? What did he say? Let's look at it one more time. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. 
If you think God's not been giving me much, maybe you and I need to re-examine our giving because we set the standard for God's giving. So God gives us money in a lot of different ways, doesn't he? But then, in addition to that, man's handling of money will affect his eternity. The rest of the time tonight, we're going to be in Luke chapter 16. If you want to turn there, I'm going to stay there. I'll, I'll work strictly from that text, although occasionally I'm known to, to pop in something that I remember at the time. But, uh, but be, really, I want to stay there. I want to talk about what Jesus said on that occasion and then watch the response that comes after that. Let's look at verse 10 first. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. What's the point? A poor manager of money with a little will be a poor manager of money with a lot. If you don't believe that, do a little bit of internet searching. And find out what's happened to most of the people who have won the lotteries. Most of them are out of money within a year. Now, we're talking about people that won sometimes millions of dollars. And it's gone in a year. What's the problem? Well, the, you know, let me tell you the problem. When you go in and give, give $2 for a piece of cardboard, that tells me a whole lot about your whole philosophy of life. Two dollars for a piece of cardboard. Your chances of hitting the lottery are about as good as, as your chance of being hit by a lightning bolt. Now, some people do get hit. That's true. But I can buy a whole lot with two dollars. I know because when Teresa and I first got married, we lived on chicken a la king. You can do it. It may not be the and she won't eat chicken a la king till this day. <laughs> when we finally got enough money to quit buying it, she don't want it anymore. You know, that's the end of it. But I'm telling you, you can do a lot with two dollars. When I lived in Georgia and saw what went on down there, literally now I was in a convenience store paying for my gasoline, standing in the line, the woman in front of me had a child, a little bitty child, little girl, with clothing so thin I could have read the newspaper through it. I promise you I could have. It was evident she was emaciated. She would not had much to eat. She's begging her mother to get her something to eat. Her mother slapped her and it flung her across the aisle to hit whatever was on the other side. And she turned around and bought $20 worth of lottery tickets. You can't feed a baby on cardboard and it'd be effective anyway. If you can't manage a little, you won't be able to manage a lot. That's what the Lord said. Now, keep going. Verse 11 of Luke chapter 16. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you haven't handled money well, who's going to give you... Now, what are true riches? Well, I'm going to give you some things that I think he was talking about. Joy is a true rich, one of the true riches. You can't buy joy. I've seen people with a lot of money that didn't look to me like they had any joy at all. You can't buy it. It's a blessing. It's a marvelous blessing. Somebody that I greeted tonight talked about the wonderful joy of being here with the saints. And I say, amen. You can't buy that. There's no way. What about peace? I'm not talking about peace in the world. Forget that. It's not going to happen. Never has, never will. You know why? James tells us why. Because men are greedy. It's real simple. I want what you have if I'm worldly. You want what I have if you're worldly. And then it's might makes right. The biggest guy is going to take the money away from the little guy, which means I'm going to always lose. But anyway, <laughs> you know, that, that's the way it is, right? But what else? You get, you get peace, that inward peace that guards your heart. Listen to 
Paul talk about it, you know, in places like Philippians chapter 4. And it's emphatic there that God will give you the peace that passes understanding to guard your heart. The world won't appreciate why you can smile when everything's so bad. It's because I don't live here permanently. My citizenship's in heaven. That's why. And you can't buy that. If I don't take care of what God gives me here, he's not going to give me anything up there either. That's what the Lord says. It keeps going. Look at him, verse 12, where he says, And if you've not been faithful in what, with what is another's man's, who will give you what is your own? You know, if you haven't done well handling the other guy's money, why would anybody give you a bunch of money to handle? They're not, they wouldn't. It just doesn't work. He goes a little bit further, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. In other words, man cannot be committed to Christ and driven by the love of money. It won't work. Never going to happen. That's the message. Well, guess what? Some of the Jews, the Jewish leaders, were there when Jesus delivered this message. And in verses 14 and 15, listen to what happens. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things. And they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God of God. Undue emphasis on money will drive people to be pretty snipey when you preach on giving. That's what the Jews were, right? Yeah, very much so. Now, I said I was going to say at least one time, I'll say it one more time. I did not come here with the impression, nobody gave me the impression that this church doesn't have a big heart. And since I've been here, I found out for sure you do have a big heart. If, and I notice big word, I F, if there's any giving trouble here with anybody, it's not because you don't have a good heart. It's just because we haven't been educated well on it. We haven't thought about it like we ought to. And I believe that you'll do with good information from the Word of God, exactly what you ought to do. I'm not even worrying about it. It's going to happen. I suspect most everybody that's here tonight is a member of the Lord's Church. What happens if you realize you've had a bad attitude about God's money? Well, simple answer. Anything that I've done that God doesn't approve of. The good news is, John says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I like that. You know, with some people, if you ever wound them, they won't forgive you. Never. Hey, you're done. But God's not that way. If you're willing to admit what you've done wrong, God will take care of you. He will he'll forgive it, and you'll start with a clean slate. But what about people outside of Christ? What about them? Well, they need to realize that it's much the same, really. When you talk about those people on the day of Pentecost, they came to realize they had literally put to death the Son of God, of all things, who now was the king over the kingdom, Lord and Christ. That's the way Peter declared him to be. They were cut to the heart. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's Acts chapter 2, verse 37. In verse 38, Peter comes right back and says, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You, I, whoever, we all, can easily have our lives transformed. They're transformed by the saving blood of Jesus Christ. All we've got to do is submit to him in penitent baptism and he will set us free. Where are you tonight? Are you with the Lord? Are you against the Lord? It can be an accident. You may not have meant to be. 
but you can't realize you are if you've realized that. Why don't you come while we sing?